The following message was delivered at the 2011 Iron Sharpens Iron Conference at Emmaus Bible College by Ken Fleming, former missionary to South Africa, author, and faculty emeritus at Emmaus Bible College. The title of his message is 21st Century Mission, Realities, Risks, and Challenges. Good evening. My wife and I have both had a wonderful weekend. Uh, nothing is closer to our hearts than the spreading out of the gospel that God so loved the world that he gave and our response to that. And uh, we're so glad that you joined us. And uh, let's look tonight at a, a verse in Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15 and verse 7 to start with. And uh, our subject for tonight is going to be understanding our world. And uh, we're going to look at its realities, its risks, and its challenges. Actually, this was a title given by uh, the man who was supposed to have been here and could not come because he had health difficulties. But I'm glad to try and uh, be with you and uh, seek to handle this subject as well as I can. We've had some great messages. Joel told us about God's mission, that it is fueled by love. We must have God-like love, and God-like love is giving love. It's love that is personal, love that is impartial, love that is sacrificial. That's the kind of love that God, dis uh, God displays. And we are redeemed to accomplish the program that he has set for us. He was followed by Alex, who was speaking on fostering a passion for mission in the church. He talked about the Lord Jesus Christ as a pillar and a proclaimer to the nations and a lamp to shine. He exhorted us to partner with missionaries on the field and get involved ourselves in what God is doing in the world. And then George told us about radical discipleship, that is, serious discipleship, giving ourselves to follow him. He talked about releasing finance so that God's work can be provided for. He talked about mega trends that are happening all around us in our world today. Rad and in his second message, he talked about a heart of grace and vision and discipline and worship. You remember those things? They all spoke to us. And action and perseverance, a greater vision and a bigger heart. And this morning, Paul and Nate gave us that wonderful father-son talk. I hardly ever heard anything like it. It was wonderful. Passing the baton of leadership, handing over the gospel. We fear things like change and we fear risk. But to get out of the rut and on the track and pass the baton, that's where missions really is. So tonight we want to close with the idea that we understand the world in which we live with its realities and its risks and its challenges. You know the times we're living are perhaps the most exciting times in all the history of the world since God created it. He created it especially for man. Man was in his view in all his physical creation. God physically formed man from the dust of the earth, quite apart from all the other things and beings. Uh, that he created. And God created man morally in his own image. And God made a bride for man and commanded them to populate the earth. And God gave Adam dominion over all the creatures of the earth. And you know that that wonderful beginning soon ended in tragedy. Satan deceived Eve into rebellion against God. Adam then chose Eve rather than God. And sin came into the world, followed, of course, by death. 
And God evicted them from the garden he'd planted for them. He cursed the serpent that tempted them. He placed the woman in subjection. He cursed the ground that Adam was to farm. And God announced that one day, a descendant of the woman would come who would crush the serpent's head and bruise the servant's heel. It was the first prophecy of the coming Savior. And in that process, God's servant, the seed of the woman, would suffer. And God was deeply offended at Adam and Eve's sin, but he didn't give up on them. He loved them. And he'd already made a plan of salvation for them and all their descendants that were to come. And that's where we begin to fit into this story. And the rest of the Bible is the story of how God worked that plan out. He made a covenant with Abraham that all the families of the earth were going to be blessed through him and his descendants. And God formed Abraham's descendants into a nation. And then he saved them from judgment when he redeemed them with blood by the pa of the Passover lamb. And he delivered them from Pharaoh through the Red Sea. And he gave them moral commandments as standards to obey. And he gave them social rules so they could live peacefully as a new nation. And he gave them spiritual requirements. God required that they worship him in certain ways and with blood and with the priesthood, and with sacrifices. And God gave them eventually a beautiful land and established them there as a nation. And he formed that land uh, into a, a wonderful land of bounteous blessing. And he gave them the beginning of their kingdom there. And he made them his witnesses to the surrounding nations. God always had in mind that surrounding nations would hear of his love and hear of his creation, creative power. But man rebelled. In the end, God sent the Babylonians to destroy their king and their kingdom and their capital and their temple. The people were taken away into, ca into captivity, into exile. And after 70 years in Iraq or Babylon, uh, some of them, a remnant, a remnant came back. But they also rejected God. And they kept on doing it. And God still loved them. God's love never died. Finally, he sent his son as a long-promised savior and the seed of the woman. But the leaders of the nation, the religious leaders too, rejected him and persuaded the Romans to crucify him. Little did they know that Jesus' death was the keystone of the very plan of love that God had already planned. God then set aside that nation until a future time. Jesus rose in triumph from the grave. Pentecost came and all the believers of this age he formed into a special people called the church, his assembly, his gathered out ones. And there to be his witnesses to the world. He still got the world in mind. God's plan is unfolding step by step all the way through. Until he calls them one day to heaven. And then he will establish his planned kingdom. And the Lord Jesus Christ, his king, will then reign over the world. And his capital in Jerusalem will be established. And all the nations of the earth shall come there and bow down to him and worship. What a day that will be. And since the time that the church was formed, nearly 2,000 years ago, there have been many ups and downs. God's plan for the church to be a witness to the world continues, not always on the upside either. But our responsible to be faithful is a key component to that plan. God, the Creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior, his plan to save men. And we are part of those whom he has redeemed and brought to himself. And uh, it matters whether you and I understand this plan. 
and it matters whether we know our part in that plan. Years ago, when St. Paul's Cathedral was being built in London, Christopher Wren was the architect, a very famous architect in England at that time. And uh, as the building was under construction, it took many years, he walked among the stone cutters who were st cutting stones, asking them what they were doing. And the first one said, I'm chipping stones. And the second one said, I'm earning a living. But the third stone cutter said this, I'm cutting stones for the great cathedral designed by Christopher Wren. You see, he saw his, he saw the big plan and he saw his part in God's plan. You'll readily admit that God has a plan. Do you know what your part is? Are you performing his part? Are you as happy as that stone cutter? even though he wasn't anything very great in terms of what people call greatness, but he had a part in what was being constructed there. And the first thing you need to understand is the nature of God's plan, and then you need to discover what your part in it is, and me, my part. And the plan for this age is stated clearly by Peter and James in the chapter that you just uh, turned to here. And notice in verse 14 of Acts 15, that God is calling out from among the Gentile nations a people for his name. That's what God is doing in this age. Calling out from among the Gentile nations a people for his name. That's missions. And we've been talking about this, that this weekend. And to accomplish this, Paul states that the Lord Jesus Christ has sent us to bring about the obedience of faith among all Gentiles, that's Romans chapter 1, verse 5, to bring about the obedience of faith among all Gentiles. Is missions important? It's right at the heart, right at the center of what God is doing. And we need to be performing our part in that, understanding God's plan. And to understand God's plan, we need also to understand the times in which we live. 1 Chronicles 12, verse 32. You see, if we do know the plan, then we ought to know the times, or the cultural context, or what the world is like around us. And uh, it is are to, it is those times that we need to, to consider very carefully. Uh, it has continually changed. Are our times the way they were in the first century? Oh, no. Are they were the way they were in the 10th century? Oh, no, they changed a lot then and they've changed a lot since. And today, not only are times changing, but the rate of change is multiplying almost exponentially. All these changes affect the way we serve the Lord. We must serve the Lord in the context of the times in which we live and the people that we want to reach are there. And uh, in our verse, Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32, First Chronicles 12, 32, it talks about the men of one of the tribes of Israel among several others. And these were the men of Issachar, the tribe of Issachar. And they understood the times, and they knew what Israel should do. That is, David had been waiting to be king for years and years and years, and these, it finally dawned on these men that what they needed to do is make David their king. And they did indeed. They anointed him king in Hebron. Very soon he was anointed again in Jerusalem and uh, he became king over the whole land of Israel. Understanding our times is important and understanding what to do about them is also important. Somebody con uh, com commented on how fast our times are changing uh, when they said this, sometimes I think that God will come down and pull civilization over for speeding. Uh, <laughs> I, I think of my own lifetime. I've lived a few years. I was born in 1927. That's about 30 years ago. And 
I was born three weeks after Linda Lindbergh made his historic solo flight over the Atlantic Ocean. It was really the beginning of, of uh, modern times and flight over the Atlantic. Since then, change has been accelerating at an ever faster rate, hasn't it? Think of the things that have changed since I was born. I was born into a middle-class home. We didn't have a refrigerator. We pushed sawdust into a great big hopper, and that, that heated the house. And, uh, and uh, uh, my dad never lost his job, even all through the Depression. But uh, life was so much different then than it is now. Technology, lifestyle, uh, business, education, communication, weapons. And you can go on and on describing things that have, have just evolved and evolved and evolved and evolved and evolved. Think about cars, what they, they were like in 1927. My first car was a 1929 Nash. It was a straight eight from here to about the wall. It had <laughs> cylinders this, bi this, this big around. It, it had a jump seat between the front seat and the back seat. It got about two miles per gallon. <laughs> Gas was only 15 cents. <laughs> um, cars are a little different today, aren't they? They're ever so much better, ever so much better looking, ever so much faster, and ever so much more fun to drive. Uh, uh, we've come a long way, probably more changes in the car technology than anything else uh, in the last hundred years or so. But all these things have changed. When I was 21 years old, 1948, Israel became a nation again. For 2,500 years, they had had no land, they had no national language, they had no temple, they had no country world identity. 2,500 years. And suddenly, nation of Israel appears again, and now 60-some years later, it's still going and still growing all the time. Do you think God was behind some of that? Do you think that's God, part of God's plan for the future being set up? I do. And uh, uh, Isaiah had, had prophesied, and uh, Jeremiah had as well, warning the Israelites that after 70 years of captivity, there would a be a remnant come back. And, and we've talked about that. But they didn't follow the Lord, and God had to scatter them again a second time, as Deuteronomy 28 uh, tells us very, very clearly, but God promised he would bring them back from all the nations, not just from Babylon, a second time in Isaiah 11, verse 1. Ever notice that? And he has begun to do that. Surely we should begin to think a little bit more clearly. God began to bring them back and the nations continued to grow and prosper amid world opposition. It's hated by almost everybody except our country and sometimes we wonder about that. And it is, in my opinion, the stage being set for the great happenings of end times. The prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel uh, predicted the regathering of the Jews from all the nations and into the promised land. And uh, you can look up reference after reference in this. I'll give them to you later if you want them. And up to now, up to now that new nation is not looking after God. They're not trusting God. Uh, they have no belief in God nationally, although there are a few believers there, and we thank God for those. And looking forward to the coming of end times, God has given us a responsibility to fulfill. Do you remember some of the parables the Lord told in view of the return of the Master? He gave them talents, and they were to use those talents or their abilities until he came again to check up on his accounts. They were looking forward to his return. There's the parable of the minas, which is, is very similar. And he gave a number of servants, each one mina, and asked them to trade with it or do business with it until he comes back again. And God has given us our lives, our, our, our means, our abilities to use for him until he comes back. And 
it will probably clarify our understanding of the times if we remember that probably the end times are very close. Now, I know a little bit about Mr. Camping and all the foolish predictions he, he, he made because he's going against what clip, uh, Scripture clearly says. But that doesn't mean the Lord's coming isn't close. And it doesn't mean the mockery of the media uh, over such things is, is true or, ought to be pay, uh, or we ought to pay any attention to it. The end times do indicate or lead me to think that we're on the verge of them coming. Think, for instance, of a few things, and these are quite real. When I was born, there were eight earthquakes a year in which somebody died. The average has grown now to 20 earthquakes per year. Have we seen any earthquakes in the last year, ladies and gentlemen? We've seen huge ones where thousands have been killed. Uh, earthquakes, the Lord said in Matthew 24. That's exactly what would be the, a mark of the end times. Jesus spoke of wars and rumors of wars. Any of those in our world today? There are 31 hot wars going on right this minute. And uh, they talk of peace. But is there any? Talk about travel. Daniel told them in the end times many would run to and fro. Uh, Lindbergh took uh, uh, two days to cross the Atlantic, barely st uh, being able to stay awake. Do you know that 200,000 people cross the Atlantic every day in an airplane today? Many are running to and fro, and some of you are going to be running across the Atlantic very shortly, I know. Uh, <laughs> global population. When I was born, there were about 2 billion people on the earth in 1927. Today, there are 350% more people on the earth than that in just these uh, few short years, seven billions of people, and at least 90% of them are without Christ and without hope. Do we have a mission? Do we have those to whom we should be witnessing? The Lord talked of false prophets that would come in the last day. Many uh, false prophets rapidly increasing, uh, joined by increasing numbers of scoffers. Do we have any of those today? All sorts of weird stuff. Just try Mr. Google. He'll tell you all about it. Uh, the alignment of hostile nations ought to make you wake up. What are the flashpoints in our world today? Uh, mentioned very clearly in Scripture in Ezekiel and Daniel. Iraq, Iran, Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, Turkey, Jordan, Russia. And where are all the hot spots in our world today? Well, they're going there. How about globalization, the efforts of man to bring everybody together, one government, one banking system, one form of money, and so on, uh, bring globalization into our world? When they say peace and safety, when they say we got it all under control, then Jesus said, sudden destruction will come upon you. And. Uh, the hatred of God's people, of Christians, by an ever-growing number of people in the world. And Jesus said it in Matthew 24 again, you will be hated by all nations on account of my name. And if these, uh, in these things that we're talking about portend the signs of the end times, then we ought to be very, very wide awake. And if those things which look forward to the glorious return of the Lord Jesus are true, and those signs were given for that purpose, then what about the calling up of God's saints to himself? It must be all that much nearer. I don't know when, and the Bible tells me not to look for when, but I think it's very soon. Uh, for instance, a, an illustration uh, about the beginning of November. You uh, begin to say, uh, when you look in the stores, you hear the ads on the radio, you look at them in the newspaper, Christmas is coming, Christmas is coming, Christmas is coming, Christmas is coming. And you see nothing but Christmas from October or something right through until the end of the year. And if you know Christmas is coming, you know Thanksgiving is ever so much nearer. And so it comes. And I think the rapture is going to be something like that. And he's going to catch us up. His soon coming ought to be this incentive for us. Let's go on to a third point. We, we must be aware of the ongoing changes. We must be aware of 
the times in which we live. But we all, also must be aware of the realities in our world. Let me tell you a few of them. God's church is growing globally. In 1927, when I was born, there were about 75 million evangelicals. Today, there are around 500 million evangelicals. That's 700% growth. When Jesus said, I will build my church, do you think he knew what he was talking about? Yes, sir, and he's still at it. And he's building it faster than ever before in history. More people are being saved every single day than ever before in history. The things are not dead. God's church is growing globally. Christian centers of growth are changing. In the 1920s, Believers, most believers in the world were in the Northern Hemisphere and they were in Northern Europe and North America. The center of gravity has moved, folks. It's not here anymore. The believing world has moved south and east. And the pagan south is becoming Christian and the Christian north is becoming pagan. Understand that we live in last days. Days in which the world of changing spiritual needs. What about urbanization? That is, people moving to cities. Um, when I was born, there were 25 cities that had a million people in them. There are 500 cities in the world today that have more than a million people in them. And the core of missions has moved from the jungles of Africa and the, and the big cities of Asia to, uh, the, trop the, to the buildings jungles or the high-rise jungles of inner cities uh, where there are huge tall buildings and slums in them. Uh, my uh, uh, son and his wife had a, had a Chinese student living with them last year and, and her family lived on the 55th floor of a high-rise in Hong Kong. 55 floors up, I bet you get a good view. <laughs> Unless you see something else there. Uh, missionary sending countries are changing. Increasingly, they're being sent from Asia and Africa and Latin America and uh, places like Korea and Brazil. And as, as George reminded us, it's, it's not just missiology, sometimes it's messiology. And they're crisscrossing each other and they're Africans coming to Texas and there are New Zealand people, uh, missionaries in Los Angeles, and there are Los Angeles people serving in, in Cambodia or somewhere like that. God is doing all sorts of marvelous things and I, I don't understand them all except that his church is growing. Jim, my son, who is the overseas director of ECS, received this letter a few weeks ago from Kiev in the, in the Ukraine. Dear Jim, it's Yuri Yur. Yesterday I shipped 20 none dare say no. That's a course on missions. I shipped 20 none dare say no to Divnor uh, Divnogorsk in Siberia. They'd like to prepare missionaries to Mongolia and Tajikistan. People in the outback of, Niger uh, of uh, Siberia, interested in Central Asian countries like uh, um, Tajikistan or Mongolia, which is between China and, uh, and Siberia. I think it's wonderful, wonderful. It's not just from North America, but we still have a job to do. That thing was signed by Yuri, and he said, praise the Lord. There are all kinds of people groups, hundreds of them waiting for someone to bring the gospel that haven't got there yet. Understanding, we must, to understand missions, we must understand some of the realities around our world. Those are just a few. Um, what about understanding the risks? And this may make you uncomfortable. God's word, God's work is done at risk. There are casualties. It is a battle. It is not done comfortably, not necessarily safely, not necessarily at uh, living long times. When we understand something of God's plan for the world and something of the times in which we live, we must also understand that if we're going to reach this world at the end of the age for the honor of his name, there are risks. What's the risk? The risk is the probability of loss in the attainment of gain. The probability of loss in the attainment of gain. Driving your car on the road, 
uh, to get to work carries some tiny risk of accident. If you're as old as I am, maybe uh, it's the risk gets a little bit greater. Driving, <laughs> don't laugh. <laughs> Driving a race car at Daytona carries a little more risk, and you're going a little faster, and uh, you better be very, very careful. If you want to win, though, your risk goes up. Playing football carries a risk of concussion or knee injury, and if you want to be the greatest pass catcher or pass receiver in the league, your risks go way up. Enlisting in the army carries risk of being injured or killed. Enlisting in the army of God carries some risks too. Four Iowans were killed in Afghanistan this month. They're willing to do that. They signed up for that. They took the risks. They've lost their lives. That's not counting those that have been, that have been injured. And I wonder how many Christian missionaries have lost their lives, and it's, it's way above that number. I cannot tell you exactly how many at all, but I do know there are risks there. And the amount of risk you're willing to accept is determined by the value of what you want to gain. How much do you value the souls of men? How much do you value those for whom Christ died? For God so loved the world that he gave. Do we? Do we? What value to put on souls of people in Uzbekistan? You don't know how to spell it. You don't know what language they might speak. Well, they speak Uzbek. <laughs> um, and you don't really think about them, and you've never looked them up in Operation World, which George told us to do. Uh, Pleasing the Lord Jesus is what he told us to do, and if he sends us and he asks us to give of our time or our abilities or our assets uh, or our, our uh, talents to please him, then that's what we ought to do. He's chosen us to be soldiers of the cross, and if you do become a soldier, his soldier, you must accept some risk in missions, the more you stand to gain for Christ, the greater will be your opposition. Is Satan active in the world today? He is indeed. And uh, the higher the risk of serious loss uh, will come, the greater you intend to gain for Christ. David took risks when he faced giant Goliath. Would you face him with a sling and five smooth stones? Uh, David's three mighty men took risks when David longed for a drink of water from the well of Bethlehem. Three mighty men stood up and said, Master David, we'll get it for you. And they walked right through the enemy camp of the Philistines into Bethlehem, and they managed to get that water, and they brought it back to David. He wouldn't drink it because it said it was a price of blood. But they valued him to the point they risked their lives to get it, and that's the point here. They risked everything to please the king. If the Lord wants you to witness to people in Tibet, or Iran, or Afghanistan, or Cambodia, or Chicago, or Urumqi, you know where that is? It's a city in western China, a great big city, Muslim, very difficult to witness in, but you can get there. Are you willing to risk your comfort, your health, your well-being for the glory of God? Um, if Jim Elliot had asked you to join him in reaching Aukas, as he called them, or Waurani, as they're known today, knowing what you do now, would you have joined him? Oh, well, you know, I've got children. Oh, well, I, I've got grandchildren coming. Oh, well, on and on we go. What are you willing to risk? losing for the Lord Jesus. Would you risk your lifestyle? Would you risk your clothing style? Would you risk the sports events you like to see or witness? John and Isabel Kuhn gave themselves to reach Lisu people in mountains of southern China on the border of Burma. Gladys Aylward, by herself, an Irish girl, crossed Russia and Siberia 
uh, to, to get to China and care for some orphans there. Jim Elliot had it right when he said he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep, his life, his money, his health, his clothing, his time, gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose, and that is the blessing and pleasure of God. He and four others risked their lives. They couldn't keep them. To gain the souls of wow people, and they didn't live long enough to see how God was going to do it, but he did it by their very sacrifice. Not always we learn how God uses pain and suffering to accomplish that's, uh, his purposes, but that's one where we do have a lot more knowledge than we might have. Are you ready to risk your health to bring those with AIDS or TB or malaria to Christ or amoebic dysentery or black water fever or a host of other nasty things? Ken, stop talking about that stuff. I don't like to hear it. Would you risk your wealth to live as the Lord Jesus did? Without a home? With only one garment? Nowhere to lay his head at night? Will you risk your reputation that you might have had and you stayed in your occupation or business or whatever and excelled in some spec a secular field and they wrote you up in who's who? Helena and I knew a lady named Mrs. Price in Durban in South Africa, and one day she said to us, with all the abilities you have, why do you waste your lives with the native Zulus when we need you? Was she right? No, she was dead wrong. Imagine how Jesus would have responded to her. Our comfortable lifestyles may be attractive, we love to be near our families. We enjoy worshiping and fellowship with our kind of people. We like to listen to good preaching and teaching. We like putting the kids in good youth programs or schools. We like to give them all the advantages we can possibly have, sometimes things we didn't have. And some of us miss God's best because we're afraid of risking the temporal comforts of the American dream, the American lifestyle of living. What did, the Lord, what did Paul say? Whatever was gain to me, whatever things were gain to me, those I counted loss for Christ. And in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. The Lord told Peter to feed his sheep. John 21. You know what? Some of his sheep are terrorists, and some of them are, cri uh, are in crime empires in Sicily, and some of them are in drug cartels in Mexico, and some of them are Muslim fundamentalists, and some of them are Buddhist extremists in Myanmar, and some of them are Hindu radicals in Bihar province of India. And who among us is willing to feed them? It's for them that God so loved the world. To them that he gave his son. What was the Lord's condition for Peter so he would feed Christ's sheep? Peter, do you love me? Okay, Lord. But what about John? Peter, never mind. Do you love me? Feed my lambs, feed my sheep. Perhaps you've noticed some pictures down in the library of Evelyn Anderson and B. Cozen. Uh, they were Emmaus grads who went to Laos in Southeast Asia. Communists move in to their town of Kenkok one Sunday morning, shot them both dead, and burned down the house in which their bodies were living. Two young missionary men were on the other side of town at the, that same morning, and they were captured, and they had to march 500 miles from, from that town of Kenkok to Hanoi and be put in the Hanoi Hilton uh, which was not a little, not quite like the Hiltons that you may know, Lloyd Opal and Sam Maddox. Or come with me to Adana, Turkey, where I was with a, a, an Emmaus team once, and an OM worker uh, took us out there to a graveyard and said, I want you to see this. And there was a, a, a gravestone there, and the name on it was David Goodman. And uh, David had been shot point, at point-blank range one morning when somebody knocked at the door and he answered it. He was gone. And the 
gravestone had been abused. It had been rocks thrown at it and was tilted at a cockeyed angle. And it had the name David Goodman on it and it had the date of his birth and the date of his death. And it had one word, Isachi. Isa is the Turkish word for Jesus. He was a follower of Jesus. He'd heard the call, follow me. He had followed, lost his life. Was it worth it? If you were his sister, or if you were his mother or father, would it be worth it? Follower of Jesus. Then Colin Brewster, who the, was the worker with the OM at the time, gave us a lecture on what we, would, what we might be willing to give for Christ. Understanding, fifthly, the challenges. If you understand the plan and understand the times and understand the risks, we need to understand the challenges in front of us. The challenges are things we need to do in order to take advantage of the opportunities God gives us. Early American missionaries uh, with assemblies were on the cutting edge of missions in Africa. Uh, they died like flies going out there. Um, many of those missionaries, I was reading about one group the other day that went out to be with Fred Stanley Arnott, and there were 13 of them, and seven of them died before they got to the place they were going. Uh, and they didn't complain. Most of them, half of them that went out, never came back in those early days. And uh, uh, this has happened in Africa, in the Middle East, in South Asia, in Papua New Guinea, in South America. They got to the front of the battle line and they pulled down Satan's strongholds and they established groups of God's people where those strongholds of Satan had been. Today, just count them up. Most of our missionaries are in places where they've been missions for a long time. We got mission stations that are 110 years old and nobody's ever thought about moving on. Is that like Paul? And they bring in more stuff every month and they build their fences higher around it so nobody will come in and steal it. And then the Africans help them cart it in and see it all. And then it's locked up. Is that missions? Paul joined them? Every field has its frontiers, and we ought to be moving on. Paul established churches, strong churches, appointed elders. There was leadership there, and then he moved on to another. Oh, yes, he was willing to revisit. He was willing to write them letters. He's willing to help them when problems came, and they got problems. But he moved on, planted church after church after church. You see, where the enemy is strong, where missions is risky, where people have never heard the good news, these are the places that we ought to be going to. Nepal, Lebanon, Turkey, China, Cyprus, Israel, Cambodia, Egypt, Myanmar. We have people in all those countries. Thank God for them. But it's only one quarter of uh, all our missionaries. We need to pray and plan to have more workers that will go out into the frontiers and target some of these unreached peoples. Pioneering new frontiers. Elders and uh, leaders in our churches need to acquaint themselves with some of the great possibilities, some of the strategic things they can do in personal prayer and assembly prayer and in finding out where people would go and where young people can, can uh, consider uh, serving God and bringing the glorious news of the gospel there. If you can name 10 baseball players or 10 music stars, and you can't name 10 missionaries, you are sinning. And I don't want you to raise your hands because I'm afraid I'd see too many. Can you name 10 missionaries? I hope you can. I hope you can. Something's wrong with our priorities, you know. And we need to adapt to different entry strategies. Our world is changing. Um, there is no place in the world that's shut up so tight that you can't get the gospel in there somehow. Um, uh, if you've got a master's degree and English is a second language, you can go and teach English in almost any country of the world. Uh, and that's not a hard degree to get. And you could serve God there and have time and be talking and working with people all day long. Great, great opportunities. Uh, you can use it carefully to witness people you meet. 
Uh, one of our workers is going in and out of northern Iraq, working for years on the translation of, of the New Testament in a local Kurdish dialect that's there. And uh, we have in our number here, uh, uh, right here in this room, uh, the, uh, uh, what's his name's from Detroit? That's my brain going so well, as it <laughs> usually does. <laughs> Uh, uh, who work on the Thai Dom language, a, a language in Vietnam, and they're almost finished with the New Testament, and it's getting ready to be published uh, just later this year. I think that's wonderful. And uh, this group of people will have the Word of God in their own language. Um, so, so many opportunities are before us. And uh, I read of some people that heard about the Maldive Islands. They're islands that are south and uh, west of India. And they're probably the hardest place for Christians to go of anywhere in the world. But he got off the internet all the fax addresses in Maldives, and suddenly all at one time he mailed every one of the fax addresses a good gospel presentation in their language. Of course, the fax addresses were all shut down the next week, but the messages got through. <laughs> That's innovative. That's great. Do it again. Uh, you won't do it again there, but you, you may do it somewhere else or, or think of other ideas like that. Innovative ways to get the gospel out. Uh, we have a missionary orientation program. In fact, there'll be another one starting next week. And uh, I'm amazed at how ill-prepared some of the people that are interested in missions are. I'm also otherwise amazed about how well-prepared others are whole range of different, uh, different kinds of preparation areas there. We need men and women who are trained, trained in evangelism, trained in the Word of God, trained to teach it, trained to disciple others, trained to plant churches. And the ideal training ground may be a local church where it's well run and where there's an active evangelism program going and discipleship going on. But how many elders are taking their young people into evangelistic sites and mentoring them as they disciple young, younger believers? I, an elder called me uh, a few weeks ago and we were talking about uh, uh, a certain potential missionary and uh, I asked him, well, have you had a chance to mentor this girl or has anybody had? Oh no, 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 we're far too busy for that. Then something's wrong. Something is very, very wrong. And uh, uh, we could go on and tell all kinds of stories like this. Um, some of them you wouldn't e I wouldn't even want to make public. But uh, uh, it's very easy for missionaries who settle on stations and sort of pastoral settings to, to uh, sort of enjoy life. And they settle down for life. They, build, they have a house or they buy a house and, and they stay in one spot. And 20 years later, they're still there, except the house may be bigger and it's better furnished now. And they're getting more and more comfortable and more and more like they were back in the States. And they're, they're just helping one little local church that existed before they got there. And there aren't any more planted. You see, if somebody had a vision to plant your local assembly, your local church, and you haven't got a vision to plant another one, you're failing. And that's the same for missionaries. It ought to start here. They ought to see it modeled. Our young people ought to see that kind of thing modeled. Evangelistic thrusts moving out from local churches. But it's becoming much rarer than we'd like to see. It's easy for missionaries to, to do this kind of thing. And sometimes the gap between the, the lifestyle, of, the high lifestyle of missionaries and a much lower lifestyle of people they live with stops the communication from getting across effectively, looking up to that lifestyle. Missionaries ought to be very careful of the lifestyle they live, even though they could afford it because of what it might do to others. Um, Nate works garbage heat, garbage city, or whatever they call it in Cairo. Would those people understand a nice middle-class house? No, they wouldn't. And he watches the way he lives. He watches what he eats, what he wears, what he drives, and so on. Um, oh, we do it because one, another missionary did it, and so we do it too. That makes it right, doesn't it? On what level did our master live? You know the answer. What level can we be most effective for the kingdom of God? In the April Missions Magazine, there's an article about Sheldon Crutchfield. 
missionary who lives in Hong Kong. He worked among refugees from Vietnam for a long time, and, and he visits them several times a year now. And he writes about this visit. Let's see if you'd like to go along with Sheldon on his next trip. Uh, two of the Vietnamese met him at the airport in Hanoi at midnight, took him to a hotel where the temperature was 40 degrees. The bed was a cloth-covered board and two blankets. They traveled for 10 days visiting Christians, teaching the word, who were now living for God, sometimes under surveillance from hostile communist government officers. He stayed in their homes with similar boards to sleep on in the cold. I love it when he puts himself on the line. He doesn't worry about his own comfort for the glory of God and to teach believers who are now trying to reestablish themselves and trying to grow in the faith. And, uh, and uh, uh, he is willing to put up with that and go back again and do it again. That's the kind of uh, mindset we ought to have. We need to concentrate on essentials. What are the essentials? I remind my students all the time. Evangelism, discipleship, planting churches. All the rest of the things they may do are peripheral. They are ancillary or ancillary. Not quite sure how you pronounce that word. Never mind. You know what it means. It's extra. You may be a good pilot, a good doctor, a good nurse, and you do all the doctoring you want to, but if you can't concentrate on, on you, you can't uh, evangelize patients there, you don't learn the language, you don't disciple people, you don't be, pl play a, an important part in some local church, you're not a missionary. You're just a doctor. You're just a pilot. I'm not sure I want to commend you as a missionary if that's all you're going to do is drive an airplane. It's like driving a taxi. I have no problem with pilot. I ride in lots of missionary planes and may continue to uh, later, later on. But I want that pilot to take an active part in local, among local people in evangelizing and discipleship and, and, and church planting. Let's revitalize our spiritual efforts too. Our missionary praying. We need fresh information made available so we can pray, not as we heard, God bless the missionaries, but praying for people who need to know Christ and knowing who to pray for and pray for them by name and Pray for them in the conditions in which they have been described to you. And uh, get this vision of the world before you. There's lots you can do. Missionaries will tell you what you can do. Understand God's plan. Understand the times. Understand the realities. Understand the risks. Understand the challenges. There's a young lady sitting in the back seat of this room right now. She's a great gal. Her name is Beth. She lives in London. And she works at Hyde Park. Every Sunday, Sunday afternoon she goes to Hyde Park and meets with radical Muslims there. And among others, she stands up on a little step stool. They call it a ladder. And she has, and I've been there and seen her and, and uh, watched her do it. And I've been there when Muslims are right up within six inches of her face and they're shouting at the top of their voice at her. She just waits for them and said, when you're finished, I've got answers for all your questions. Doesn't back up an inch. She's moving in the next few weeks because of so many murders on the street where she lives for the glory of God. You want to join Beth? You want to join Beth? She talked about a girl called Dejle. Ask her about her just the other day. Dejle was a girl who was, was, uh, came from the Hezbollah and uh, she was sent to London to learn English so that she could be a translator for this radical uh, group, Hez Hezbollah. And she met some British missionary gals. And Dejle got saved. And Dejle's family was furious. And they sent the gangs out to get her, and they broke into the place where she was living and, uh, and, and dragged her out and put her in a car and be beat her up and, and uh, uh, stabbed her and chucked her out of the van on the road at midnight and, and, and drove off and, and left her there. Fortunately, she was found. She did get better. She was hidden again. But God had his purposes for Dejle. And uh, she got back to Turkey, where she came from, and she went to a Bible college or Bible school 
called Tyrannus Bible College or Ty Bible School, I forget which, right there near Ephesus where Paul met in the school called the School of Tyrannus. That's where it got its name. And she found a man, a man there who married her and uh, they began to have a witness in Turkey. And I think they're in another country now, maybe even, in fact, uh, Bethy thought maybe they were there in uh, this country by now. But God used them. God blessed a girl who was put on the line and those who were helping her to do things for his glory. That's the kind of person that we need. As we close, you're willing to not only know God's plan and know your times and know the realities and know the risks and accept the challenges. My brother did that. If you got one of those books about him, you'll read it. Quoting Psalm 71, the day he landed in Ecuador, he wrote, Oh God, forsake me not until I have proclaimed your arm to this generation. Winning on to quote Psalm 60, he says, We trust that through God we shall do valiantly. And uh, the night before he had written, I cannot summon any great emotion. In one sense, tomorrow is only tomorrow. Yet to see it in the dimensions of our whole lives, it makes it a day of significance. Oh, may it make us like Christ and increase our faith to expect miracles in conversion, in discipline to discipleship, in establishing assemblies, in entering into our inheritance. The experiences I, sh I shall have will put the promises of God to the ultimate test, a proving ground for God himself. And the next morning, as the ship was pulling into the dock, he and Jim were standing by the rail. And Pete writes in his diary, Jim and I sang quietly, faith of our fathers, holy faith, we will be true to thee till death. I do want to be committed to the work there, laying down my life for their faith. A few weeks later, he visited the Colorado tribe, which was on the western side of the mountains there in Ecuador. And he wrote, I would gladly give my life for that tribe, if only to see an assembly of those proud, smart people gathering around a table to honor the sun." Gladly, gladly, gladly. He said a little bit later in his, his diary, we're going to the most discouraging of situations. I've been encouraged to note the strategic importance of the present missionary activity in terms of the Lord's coming. Our hands are on the plow for finishing up the work of God here on earth. Pete said, I want to get to needy people, to train disciples, to see Indians coming into the kingdom, establishing a witness to all the nations of earth. I do not cease to praise the Lord that he's lifted me from the mainly theoretical and student life, so brittle and bookish and dull, and has thrust me into the frontier where the battles are being fought. Hallelujah. On November 9, 1961, long after he had died. It was a memorable day. I was talking about it this afternoon or this morning to uh, the, the uh, other class. And he says, that was the day on which the first nine believers among the Warani were baptized as a public expression of their faith. Dr. Fully, Fuller of the Vosandis Hospital came out to the wild village of Tueno and baptized them. And among those attending was the Tuena villagers were Elizabeth Elliot's brother, David Howard, and Rachel Saint's brother, Phil, and Ed McCulley's father, T.E. McCulley. Mr. McCulley had seen Dioma baptized in Wheaton, and here he was. Uh, a year or so before that, he had been praying with Bill McDonald, then president of Emmaus Bible College. McCulley had prayed, Lord, let me live long enough to see those fellows saved who killed our boys, that I may throw my arms around them and tell them I love them because they love my Christ. And that day, he got to throw his arms around all five of those killers who had come to Christ. And he said to each one, I love you because you love my Christ. If God so loved the world, 
that he gave his son, will we? It begins with God's love. Kevin was singing for us, what wondrous love is this, O oh my soul, that Christ laid aside his crown. Makes us think, doesn't it? If God so loved the world that he gave his son, will we? Do we understand his plan? Do we understand the times in which he lives? Do we understand the risks in completing his plan? Do we understand what our part in his plan may be? Oh God, we thank you for the wondrous love that the Lord Jesus displayed in the, on the cross of Calvary, that he loved us enough to give his son to be our savior. And we pray that we might give back to him all of which he claims from us, our lives, our loves, our abilities, our resources, whatever we have for him that the world may hear and know and receive the Savior and that God might be glorified through it all. Help us, we pray, at the end of this conference be different men and women than we were when we came. Work in our hearts so that we are effective servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen.